All right, last time we took a look at section 1.2, or at least we started taking a look at it. And I know we had covered uh, the first item on the um, list, which was graphical limits. We talked about this graph in particular and about how limits graphically, what we're looking at is tracing along our curve of our graph towards a specific x value, either from the left if it's got the little negative after it like problem B did, or from the right if it's got the little positive after the value, which is what problem A did, or from both directions if it doesn't have either one. You guys remember that? Okay. And I had alluded to the fact that we were going to do something with something called the numerical limits. And it's going to feel a little bit like what we did in section 1.1, but easier. And we all smiled and said, okay, that's nice. Easier is always good. All right, so here's an example. And what I need you to do is I need you to grab out your calculator, okay? So grab your calculator. If you don't have it with you, don't grab your phone. It's not going to be very practical or helpful. Look on with somebody else or just trace down or copy down what we've got, okay? But start bringing that with you. Bring those calculators to class. I want you to take your Y equals button. So hit Y equals. And I want you to put in this equation, x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. Now, keep in mind as you're doing that, most of you have calculators that either are going to make you put it in like this, or it might actually look physically like this, where it does it in this nice math text type kind of thing. Um, but if you are having trouble getting it entered in your calculator, let me know. Who is without a calculator today? One here, we've got three over here, huh? Okay, I'd like for you guys to be able to look on with somebody nearby you. So, Jason, right? Jason's gonna look on with, what's your name, remember, remind me? Oh. Tyler, so Jason and Tyler are gonna look on. Um, I'm gonna let you two boys borrow this one. And then, Hannah. Hannah, that's what I was thinking. Hannah is going to look on with, okay. Nate, Hannah, Nate. Okay, so we're good. Okay, so if you, if you don't already have this, let me know and we'll kind of wait, but does everybody have this? Well, I guess that's not quite true because Anderson and Josh don't yet, right? Are you guys getting it in there? Okay. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to do like we did last time. We're going to choose values on either side of the number three. Values that are a little bit smaller on one side and values that are a little bit bigger for the other side. Do you remember what the first number was that I picked? I actually had the number three last time. What was the first number we picked that was a little bit smaller than three? 2.9. And there's really nothing special about 2.9, but it's kind of a nice, convenient place to start. After 2.9, what did I do? 2.99. And then the third one? 2.999. Okay. And then let's just fill in that table on the other side as well. What did I pick for being a little bit bigger? 3.1. Does anybody remember what happened next? 3.01. Good, you guys remember well. And then the last one? 3.001. What we're going to do is we're going to use that table feature in the calculator. So hit table. Um, if you didn't have your calculator here last time, did it, is anybody in that situation you didn't have it here last time? Everybody had it with them? So when you click on table, you have the ability to put a number in your table, everybody. Good. Go ahead and enter these values, 2.9, 2.99, 2.999, 3.1, 3.01, 3.001. And what we're going to do is we're going to write down the Y values in our table. So the first y value that I think you're going to be having is 5.9. Does that look right? Yes? Okay. What's after 5.9? Awesome. And then the third one? And I will tell you in advance, they won't all work out so beautifully, but this one is awfully pretty. It's very nice. How about with the 3.1? What do you get? Was it 6.1? Okay, and what's the next one? Awesome, and again, not always gonna work out so pretty. But what we wanna do is we wanna go down our table and ask ourselves, what number are we getting close to? And we wanna do it from you know, each table independently. They won't always be the same. So if I go down the table that's this, the 2.9-ish numbers, what value am I getting close to? Six. And then if I go down the table with the 3.1-ish numbers, I'm getting close to 6, okay? So that's a good thing. If it's getting close to the same value, 
That's the equivalent to being back on this, pec this picture right here when we were looking at the value at x equals 0. I'm getting close to the value that's the same value from both sides. Put a number slightly smaller, put a number slightly bigger, and I'm getting close to the same y value. Make sense? So we would say then that this one has a limit. This limit, let me erase what I've got going on up here, is 6. And we numerically approximated it to believe that that's the case. Are we good with that? Okay. We're going to do the same thing with another problem and change it slightly up. You didn't get those values? I do know why you want to see the Your x minus 3 needs to be Yeah. Um, to anybody else's? What's that? I did it the same way last time and then I got a table and it was all negative values and then I did it this time and now they crashed and stuff. I have no idea what's going on. Why do you believe the graph is that cool? Because it looked different last time I had it. It's just because it's a graph. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like last, uh, last class period or something? No, no, that's why I changed it this time. This looks like the right, the right graph. Okay, it was messed up last time. Probably so, yeah. Oh, that graph looks right. Yeah. Um, it, it has a line between the line, but then it's not running the change today. Alright, so we're going to hit the seconds. Anybody else have a calculator question? We definitely want calculators working correctly, for sure. Everybody over here is okay? Good. Oh, All right, problem three. What does problem three do differently than problem two? One tiny little change. Plus. So it means changing your calculator is easy. And all of your tables already in there and set up. None of it's going to be did any different. Oops, I wanted to do the same order. So this is 2.9, 2.99, 2.99. Nine, nine. This side over here is 3.1, 3.01, and 3.001. And because it's all the same values, you really shouldn't have to change your table either. Your table is just going to give you different output values. Plus sign. Okay, so Nate, tell me what your first one was in the 2.9. 174.1. Okay, does anybody else have that? That is what you should have. That is right. Somebody tell me what your second one is. Tyler, why don't you have the second one? You got a different one? Okay, you haven't got it in yet. Okay. And it will have decimal places after that if you were to select it, but I'm not too concerned about it, and you'll see why in a minute. What's the next one? Okay, so we went from negative 174 to negative 1,794 to negative 17,994. That's what we did, right? Okay, how about the other side, 3.1? What do we get for that one? Is your calculator okay? Is it looking all right back there? Yeah? Okay. What's the next one? One, eight, what is it, 1806? So 1,806 and then what? 18,006. All we did was change the sign. So let's go down our tables. What? is happening as I go down this first table. Getting bigger. Getting bigger. Very fast, actually, right? Yeah. So what would we say that that is approaching? Infinity. Yeah, it's negative infinity. I'm glad you said the negative. Absolutely, it is negative infinity, right? It's actually getting big and small because right, it's negative. Okay. So it's actually infinitely small. But big numbers. What about the other table? That one's positive infinity, right? So I want to talk a little bit. So the answer here, um, by the way, should be that it does not exist. And it's not because it's infinities and negative infinities. Why is it that it doesn't exist? 
They're approaching different values. They don't equal each other, right? If both of these had said infinity, we could say that the limit's infinity. Um, there, there is justification for being okay with that idea, okay? Uh, but it's because they don't match that we're saying it doesn't exist. All right, why in the world, this is not, um, and we'll come across this in the next section in 1.3 next class period for more, more specific reasons, but why in the world would changing that one little sign wreak such havoc? Any thoughts? Yeah, Nate. Yeah, That's a true statement, but it's not what's causing the problem. Good try. What do you have? It goes on the numerator. One word character, or whatever it's called, gets canceled out. Yeah. So if you'll remember a little bit about algebra when you were doing rational expressions like this, you have the ability then, and you have the ability to now, to, to be able to factor things when, when they do a factor. And this one did, right? So on problem number two, this one actually has the ability to eliminate a factor in the numerator with the denominator, and this one doesn't have that ability. So when you eliminate this denominator factor, what happens is you get a hole in the graph. So that's why your graph looks like a line, Nate. This really is a line with a hole in it at x equal three. But this graph, if you graph this, I know you guys, most of you still have it in your calculator, it does not look like a line, right? What's happening at x equal three on this graph? There's an asymptote there, right? And what happens when you have an asymptote is that one side shoots up really high and the other side shoots down really low. So that's exactly where we've got this sort of a disconnect going on there. Make sense? Okay. All right, we're going to develop the one last thing. Everything from, that we've done from here backwards is the stuff on WebAssign um, and a little bit of what's going on in the next part. But everything from here forward is the homework that's going to be written, okay? All right, so we're going to take a look at considering this particular function. We're going to de sort of derive or develop the ideas that come next. Consider the function f of x equals 5x plus 2, or from 5x plus 2. This shouldn't say from section 1.2. It should say from section 1. Point, I'm sorry, 3. It's 1.2, the stuff we've just done from above material. We can find this limit, and it equals 17. Um, and actually, it is 1.3, because that's where it's going to happen. I'll talk about why this is 17 in, in section 1.3, um, but your book actually gives you the value when you do it in your book, so you're okay with that, okay? So this actually equals 17. We can use intuition to talk about why that makes sense. We could use those tables. We could look at a graph, and we could trace it, and the answer would be 17. And intuitively, we look at it, and we say, well, yes, it gets infinitely close, as I want to, to the number 17 on the y value, okay? It's not a very precise definition as far as mathematics is concerned. So that's what we're going to do, is we're going to give it a more precise definition. So I want us to talk about the graph first. So let's go ahead and take this, and I, I'm not trying to sketch a perfect graph. I, I'm trying to sketch an idea for us so that we can talk about it in a way that makes sense, okay? So my graph is not trying to be to scale or anything like that, all right? It's just a, an idea. It's an image. It's a sketch only. So I am making sure that the graph is kind of steep because the slope's 5. I'm okay, making sure it's a line because that is the equation of a line. And I am crossing it above the x-axis because my y-intercept is 2. Okay, so this is a rough sketch of what it should look like. Everybody good with that? All right. Now, it talks about the limit at the x value of what? Three. So I'm going to place that on my graph. Again, this is where my to scale part is. I don't care. Um, I just know that the x value of three is on the right-hand side of the graph. I'm good with that. Okay. And if we're looking sort of graphically from the last section, what we would be wanting to know is if I were getting close to this particular value, what is the y value I'm getting close to? We're told in this problem that it's 17, right? And we have this sort of intuitive idea of sort of tracing along my curve like this and up my curve like this and saying, yep, yep, getting close to the same value. Everybody good with that so far? That's all the things we've, we've already talked about all of that so far. Okay. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to ask ourselves, okay, but how close do I have to be? How close is close enough? And that's, that's really where this, where this conversation goes from here. How close is close enough? For instance, 
If I were to want to go, and I'm going to use the number one because my example on the next page uses the number one. If I wanted to be one unit away in each direction from 17, so I wanted to be between 16 and 18 for my y value, okay? Just only one, I wanted to be within one values unit, you know, an error of one. How close would I need to be along the x-axis to make sure that that happens? How close would I actually have to be to that value of x equal 3 to make sure that I'm within one unit of the y value of 17? How close would I need to be? Okay, so we're going to answer that question specifically for these numbers 1 and x, x is approaching 3 and the y value is approaching 17. So that's going to be our next page. So if you flip to your next page, some of this I already said, I just wanted the picture. Let's say we want to make sure that the function value and the limit of that function as x, appro x approaches 3 are close to one another. Perhaps we want them to only differ by one unit. If so, how close of an x value to x equals 3 is required to ensure that the limit between 5x plus 2 and 17 is less than 1? So what we said here is we want the difference of 5x plus 2 and 17, difference means subtraction, right? We want their difference. And we don't even care if it's a little bit more up to one or a little bit less down to one. That's why this is an absolute values. It's the distance we care about, and absolute values are how we measure distances. So we have the absolute value of the difference between the two values, and we want that to be within one, only one ahead or one below of 17. That's where this equation, not equation, excuse me, that's where this inequality is coming from. All right, so what do we do? Well, we're going to solve this inequality, at least sort of. What we really want to do is we want to solve the inequality to the point where we get absolute value of x minus 3 is less than a number. Okay? We're not solving for x. We're solving for x minus 3. You should be thinking, okay, but why x minus 3? I mean, that seems a little arbitrary. Well, it's x minus 3 because the limit is as x approaches 3. Do you see that? That's why that's happening here. This is as x approaches 3. So if this was as x approaches 5, we would want the absolute value of x minus 5. If it was the limit of x approaches 1 half, we'd want x minus 1 half. If it were negative, that's okay too. Like let's say we're negative 1, it'd be x minus negative 1. Okay, so that whatever the limit as x approaches, that's what goes in here. Okay, so we're going to solve this inequality. So what, how do you simplify 5x plus 2 minus 17? What do you get? Don't everybody answer at once. I'm going to go with 5x plus or minus 15. How do you think? It's okay? Nobody's complaining. Now's the time to complain if you don't know what I did. Any guesses how we would get from that expression to the x minus 3 expression? Take out a 5, right. So we're factoring, right? And, and what we're really doing is we're factoring out the absolute value of 5. I, I recognize that that's just 5, but if it were negative, it wouldn't be, right? If I were factoring out a negative 5 and then absolute valuing it, I would get 5. So keep that in mind. The x minus 3 stays the same when we have this less than 1. We could actually write it like this because the absolute value of 5 is 5. I'm almost done. What do you think my last step is? Divide by 5. So this was our goal. Our goal was to find the x minus 3 absolute value alone and to find whatever value over here corresponded to it. So let's go back to that picture and talk about what that meant. This picture says that my y value is within 1 on either side of 17, right? Up to 18 down to 16. I can't go out 1 on the x-axis and make that work, right? How far can I go out? 1 fifth. That's what this found. This found how far away from x equals 3 I can actually be. How far away can I actually be? One-fifth. I have to be within one-fifth of the number 3 in order to make sure that I'm within 1 on either side of the number 17. Okay. But we arbitrarily chose the number 1 on either side of 17, right? There was nothing special about that. I said, let's just choose 1. Well... We're going to arbitrarily choose epsilon instead. 
This is the precise definition of limit. I will tell you right now, I will ask you to re rewrite this word for word on your test. There's very few things that I want you to memorize, and I'm going to make you memorize this one. Well, I mean, I'm going to ask you to memorize this one and hope that you will so you'll get the points for it, okay? Memorize this definition of limit. For a function f defined in some open interval containing a, but not necessarily at a itself, okay? So that's, that's the, th the three I was just talking about on the bottom, somewhere around x equals three. We can say that the limit equals the number l, that's a y value, if for any number epsilon greater than zero, okay, so picture-wise, what are we doing? Picture-wise, my epsilon is over here. So here's my limit value L, and my epsilon is right here. This is epsilon. I did write it right, but it doesn't look very good. Let me try that again. Okay, this is epsilon. My curly braces almost look like epsilons, in fact. Yes. Your notes say different. Do they use C? Okay. Okay. I think it's a textbook change is why that happened. That's okay. I probably forgot to change it on this slide. The whole definition's different. What do I have written down here? It's just a few of the wordings. It's not really different. We say that, and this one says the statement, this. It's the same. It's saying if we have this epsilon around this L value, and I'll use C since your notes have C in them. Here's the C value. That the distance that I'm able to find right here is delta. So for any epsilon that I pick, any little bit of difference between the Y value, I'm able to find a corresponding little bit of difference in the X value. That's what this says. There is a place where I can find this corresponding difference in the x value. Your notes have a c here. There we go. I think everything else, because my notes match yours too, are the same. Okay, so let me show you how that works with the actual problem just as soon as you're done writing. So the first blank is this limit blank. And the second blank is this one. And your third blank is this one. So as long as I'm super close enough with those deltas to the value of C, I will be super close enough to be within the epsilon that I wanted to of the value L. That's what this says. I can make it as close as I want. So we're going to pick back up with that same example that we had, or do, did I finish it out? Yeah, I didn't finish it on that one. There it is. I skipped the slide. Oh, is that what happened? I skipped it and I didn't actually tell you I skipped it. I'm sorry. I hit this button too many times. No wonder it didn't make sense. Um, so let's use that definition with what we've got going on here. Um, there's very slight change, and it's very slight. The only thing that happens is over here I have an epsilon. What did I have over there before? A one, right? That's the only thing I had. There's only difference. And so when I'm solving my inequality and I have 15x minus, I'm sorry, 5x minus 15, it's less than epsilon. And I take out that 5. I recognize the absolute value of 5 is 5, so I'm going to take out a, a positive 5. And then I can actually write this x minus 3 in absolute values. And then instead of it 1 fifth over here on the right, it's epsilon over 5. What we were able to do is we were able to decide that that is the delta value. So we would need epsilon over 5 in this particular problem. The name we call that value is delta. That's the name we give it. The mathematics behind what we did is virtually identical. Okay? There is a change to what happens after we do the mathematical computational part of it, though that we haven't done yet. So I've got a couple of examples for us to take a look. All 
All right. Um, my directions say find the limit L. They already give you the limit in these problems, so I didn't need that part of it. I apologize. That was the old book I was using. I apparently didn't get it erased. All right, we have this epsilon minus delta. That's what it looks like. Epsilon delta is how we read it. Epsilon delta proof that we're going to create for this limit. The problems that you're dealing with in this section will tell you what the limit value is. So this one says the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 3x plus 2 equals negative 4. We have all the values we need. Okay? I would like for you to set up the two inequalities, the one that we're going to need, like the answer part, and the one that we're going to start with. So the first one that we're going to start with always takes the whole function, 3x plus 2, and it subtracts the limit value, in this case minus a negative 4, and it always has is less than epsilon. It will always start that way. So if you'll look back at your definition, this is the f of x value, this is the limit value, and we're subtracting them. Our goal, where we want to end up, <coughs> is we want to end up with x minus what x is, x is approaching. So x minus negative 2 to be less than some value here. I mean, that, that's kind of what we're looking for. But we're wanting it to say x minus negative 2 on the left. Or what else might it say that would be equivalent? x plus 2. I mean, that, that's the reality. It's going to say x plus 2, right? <coughs> okay, and we're going to be looking for that value. Okay, so we started here. We're going to work our way down to the bottom just like we did on the first problem. All right, first step, I'm going to combine what I can inside of the absolute value. What does that give me? Right, 3x plus 6. What do I do next? I factor something out, a 3. You got it. Factor out a 3. That leaves me with x plus 2. It's like magic, right? Wow. It'll look a little bit less magical in the next problem, unfortunately. What's the, what's the last step? Dividing by 3. So I end up with x minus, two, minus negative 2, or x plus 2, less than epsilon over 3. This is sort of the question that I was looking for. That's the value I was looking for, OK? Now I have to actually write the process out to show the proof. It says use the epsilon definition to prove something. So this doesn't look like a geometry proof. What it's really going to look an awful lot like is that definition that I told you you have to memorize. That's what it's going to look like. So you're going to make a statement. You're going to write out a statement that looks an awful lot like this. We know that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 3x plus 2 equals, was it negative 4? Yes, negative 4. I need a little more space. Let me move this. So you can't do that on a chalkboard, right? All right, negative 4. <clears throat> and now we're going to say why we know it. And the reason we know it is the because for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta. And what is the delta equal to in this problem? Do you know? Epsilon over 3. It's the thing we solved for in sort of the first part of the problem. So it's whatever we solved for and got. So the last problem we did, it would have been epsilon over 5. This problem is epsilon over 3. There exists an epsilon over, a delta equal to epsilon over 3 such that When 
And you can write x minus negative 2 or x plus 2, either way. x plus 2 is less than epsilon over 3, or is less than delta, if you want to write delta there. Then f of x, that was my 3x plus 2, minus the negative 4 is less than epsilon. As long as I'm super close within epsilon over 3 on the x-axis, I'm guaranteed to be within epsilon on the y-axis. That's what this says. As long as I'm within epsilon over 3 on the x-axis, I'm guaranteed to be within epsilon of the y-axis. Okay? You've done two examples now that look like this. They're both equations that are lines, right? Lines are very straightforward to do this for because they all boil down to the same thing. Add whatever common, you know, parts of it are constants in the middle and then factor something out. And whatever you end up with is exactly what you were wanting to end up with. Okay? So I want to show you one example where it works out a little differently. This is not an equation of a line, correct? No, it is not. It is an equation of a parabola. And so things are going to happen a little bit differently. Now, the process and our goal are still the same. We're still starting with this absolute value of the function, x squared minus 3, minus a limit value. Sorry, it should have been given to you as well. I didn't get that in there. It's 1. If there's any that, I don't think I assigned any, but I might have. If I did assign any that doesn't give you the limit value, like maybe this doesn't actually say equals 1, um, you can do it with the numerical or graphical limits like we did earlier in the section. Okay, so that's still possible. You could still look at this graph and you could trace along it on your calculator. You could create those tables using values surrounding x equal to 2 um, and do that. So we're going to put the 1 here. And it's less than what? What value goes right here? Which Greek letter is it? Epsilon, Epsilon is the first one, right? And then our goal down here is the same as before. It's to have x minus the value x approaches. What is x approaching? 2. So I'm go my goal is to say x minus 2 less than some value. That value is going to be delta, and that's what we're looking for. Okay? So th this is still the goal. But the process is a little different. It starts out the same. The process ends a little bit differently. What happens here when I simplify what's inside? What do I get? Good. It's quadratic, right? What do we like to do with quadratics? We did it just a little bit ago to simplify something in a denominator. What do we do? We factored. Yeah, and that is what we're going to do here as well. How does x squared minus 4 factor? Good x plus 2 and x minus 2. And we can separate the absolute values for those. And we notice that one of them is the one we want, right? And one of them is one we don't want. Or it's not the one we want anyway, right? So which one is the one we want? x minus 2. This piece is the one we want to remain there, correct? Everything that's underlined right now in red, I don't really want to do anything to change that. I just need to figure out what to do with the x plus 2, and I can't just divide it to the other side. My value that I'm looking for with delta has to be a numerical value, epsilon over some number. It can't be over a variable. That doesn't work. So what do I do? Well, what we do is we're going to let x, this notation you may or may not have seen before means is an element of, it's going to be inside of, and it's going to be inside of a value nearby x equal to 2. I want to be near x equal to 2, right? I mean, that's the whole part of the problem. It says x approaches 2 up here. So I want to choose some x value that it can be close to 2. And the natural way to do that is to just go on 1 on either side. So we're going to let x be between 1 and 3. The x value is somewhere between 1 and 3. Okay? 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to choose, come on, choose the maximum from up here. Maximum between one and three. Which one's the biggest? I'll show you why we're choosing in a minute. But which one's the biggest? The three. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to let x equal to three. And we only want x equal to 3 in the part of the problem that we're trying to make go away. That's this part. Okay, don't go put an x equal 3 in everywhere. That is entirely unhelpful. We need the x minus 2 in the problem. It can't be changed. But I'm happy enough to let this number be 3, so I'm going to get 3 plus 2 out here. I'm going to get x minus 2 here. And out here that gives me a 5. So what will my epsilon end up being over? Five, right? So let's go back now and talk about why we chose the maximum or why, why that was the special number we picked. What happens when you divide by a bigger denominator? What happens to a value if it's divided by something bigger? It gets smaller, right? So if I were trying to decide, am I going to divide by 5 or am I going to divide by 3, the bigger value I divide by makes a smaller, tighter interval. It gives me less room for having an error. Are you guys with me? So I had a comfortably large interval, one away, and I said, what's the biggest problem that I could have? I could be one away and it'd be x equal 3. That's the biggest problem I could have. And if I put that value in, it gives me a 5 that was had here in front to divide by. Epsilon over 5 is a smaller interval with less chance of error than, say, epsilon over 3 would have been, right? That's why we're picking it, is because we're trying to minimize our error. Now, the language that we're going to write this down in is going to look almost identical to what we had before. I mean, like, practically verbatim. So what are we going to say? We're going to start with the same phrase that says we know. Come on. That the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3 equals 1. We know that. Why? Because for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta equal to epsilon over 5 on this one, right? Epsilon over 5, such that when absolute value of x minus 2 is less than that epsilon over 5, or you can write as less than delta, that would be okay. Then, absolute value of x, sorry, well, yeah, it was x cubed minus 3 minus the limit value of 1 is less than epsilon. Oops, and why did I have cubed? Yeah, this was squared. Thank you. Okay, everything else okay? Yeah. This, just like on the other problem, this is the proof that it's referring to. When it says prove, it's looking for that paragraph. And if you compare that paragraph back to what you guys had on your previous page, take a look at it. It says, let f be a function defined in an open interval containing c, and let l be the limit, the real number. The statement, the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, that's the first part of what I just wrote down here, right? 
means that for each epsilon greater than zero, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, and we found out what it was, such that if this value is less than that delta, ours was epsilon over five, then this value is less than epsilon. It mirrors the definition. Okay? What time is this class supposed to end? One. Is it supposed to end at one? Exactly? Wow, so we ended it pretty well. We didn't have any time to actually practice any. Um, the Success Center, they know you're coming with these questions, okay? And I know you're probably coming with me some questions too. So if you have any questions on this, please come and ask.